And welcome to the special audience edition of Hannity. Tonight, we are joined for the hour by the always outspoken, nationally syndicated radio talk show host, best-selling author, the great one, Mark Levin. Now, in a moment, we'll also bring in our studio audience, as you can see, of distinguished guests. But first, let's take a look inside the great one's latest book, The Liberty Amendments, Restoring the American Republic. It is now in bookstores on Amazon.com. Now, Levin is proposing 11 amendments to our Constitution and explains how each and every one could help restore this country's founding principles principles, preserve individual rights, and mark the first step towards reclaiming the country that belongs to you, the American people. Here to explain the Liberty Amendments, why he wrote the book, author himself, the great one. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Mark Levin. In many ways, um, you wrote Liberty and Tyranny, sold over a million copies. You wrote Ameritopia. Am I right in reading this book and thinking this is almost like a third in a series? It, you know, it really is. And I just want people to understand, I'm not running around writing amendments to the Constitution. What I'm doing is talking about reestablishing constitutional republicanism, because we do not have it today. Uh, and we can get into that a little bit later. What I'm saying is, unlike our opponents who evade the Constitution, who eviscerate the Constitution, uh, who try and figure out ways to centralize the government as much as they can in violation of the Constitution, I'm saying those of us who believe in individual liberty and private property rights and the rule of law and the Constitution need to look at the Constitution for answers. And it provides one under Article 5, two methods for amending the Constitution. One. Two-thirds of both houses of well, Congress. Well, as you're saying yeah. this, we're going to put on the screen Article 5 right. to explain. There are two, two methods. methods. Go ahead. Right. One of which has, has been used successfully. We have 27 amendments to the Constitution. One which is not. But that second method is not radical. It's not weird. It's there because the framers put it there, and they put it there for a reason. The second method for amending the Constitution, the first was two-thirds of Congress proposing amendments to the states, three-fourths of the states ratifying. In this instance, it's two-thirds of the states calling a convention, not a constitutional convention. Article 5 talks about a convention for the purpose of amending the Constitution, proposing amendments. And you still need three-fourths of the states to ratify. So you wouldn't have a runaway convention or anything like that, as we have today a runaway Congress, a runaway Supreme Court, and a runaway bureaucracy and president. This is a, a system put in place specifically by the framers. And George Mason insisted on it and got the support of the other members, the other delegates to the Constitutional Convention. He said, look, if Congress turns oppressive, if the federal government turns oppressive, what is recourse other than violence? We have to have a way for this to be addressed. And his recourse was the states would get together, as they often did, as they did to, to, to give birth to the nation. And, uh, and propose these amendments, and you still need three-fourths of them to approve them. But there's, there's been 27 amendments, but only the right. one method has been used. Right. You, you write at length in many ways how our framers in particular foresaw that this day would come, a day of what you call a post-constitutional America. Explain what you mean by that, and give examples of, of what you see that defines that. Well, the entire construct of the Constitution is intended to prevent what's happening today. This centralized, concentrated power of government, uh, a handful of lawyers on the Supreme Court issuing edicts, a president of the United States legislating and, and ruling by fiat, Congress getting involved in every aspect of our lives. All of this is contrary to the Constitution. So first of all, if you don't believe that, this book isn't going to interest you, and you'll go through life willy-nilly, and, uh, and you'll accept it. But some of us know that's not the case. And so we have to accept the fact that this is a post-constitutional period. And when you look at Obamacare as an example, as I've talked about, um, Congress passed a law they had no power to pass. The president signed a law he had no power to sign. The Supreme Court contorted the Constitution, amended the Constitution, if you will, and imposed it on us. And now we're being told, that's it, folks. We can't defund it. You're stuck with it. There's nothing you can do about it. And I'm saying, the hell with that. There are things we can do about it. We, maybe not tomorrow, maybe not the next day. But the more our government legislates and operates like this, the worse it's going to get. The barriers, the, the firewalls to the Constitution have been breached. You talk about in the book at length, and you go into great detail, that the left has been, the progressives, the status, as you call them, have been successful. In other words, beyond their wildest dreams, which is why you say post-constitutional America. Now, 
How does this give more power to the states? And what was anticipated, because you quote the, the Federalist Papers a lot throughout the book, what were they intending by putting this specific process in place that it could be used one day? First of all, they had to do this in part because the Constitution would never have been ratified. The, at the state conventions, uh, they were our framers too. And these delegates to these state conventions were very skeptical of this notion of this central government. You know, people don't know, if you, if you read what's available in these state convention debates, Massachusetts almost voted down the Constitution. John Adams wound up having to twist arms. He was fighting mostly his cousin Sam Adams, who was an anti-federalist. You look at Virginia, the Constitution was almost defeated. I mean, you're talking about the home of Madison and Washington and so forth. Uh, and New York, the Constitution was almost defeated. So they had to make sure if they were going to get these other states to ratify that when they presented them with the Constitution, it would empower the states, it would ensure that the states retain their sovereignty, it would ensure that the central government had specific enumerated powers, limited powers. And the final thing they had to do, because the states were proposing changes to the Constitution and they didn't want to have another convention was, they agreed that when the first Congress met, they would propose amendments to further limit the federal government vis-a-vis -vis the individual and the individual's liberty. This provision in the Constitution, Article 5, is very, very important. It is the only way that we have today that I am aware of, and if somebody has a different idea, then they ought to put it on the table, for the American people in a civil, legal, constitutional, thoughtful way to work with their state legislatures over time, not tomorrow, to begin the process of reclaiming their republic. Otherwise, these centralized decisions by a handful of uh, governing masterminds are not only going to continue, they're going to become additionally coercive. You quoted Madison, who, who pointed out that the, the powers dedicated to the federal government are few and they are defined. How far have we left that original intention? Well, now the states have few power, uh, very little power, few powers, and uh, really live at the behest of the federal government. I want you to think about this a second. The states created the federal government. The states gave life to the federal government. Now the states live at the behest of the federal government. Really, the federal government can step in, whether it's voting, whether it's the environment, whether it's the road system, whether it's the tax system. The federal government is preempting the field in all respects. So rather than checks and balances between the three federal branches, for the most part, the three federal branches are giving their imprimatur one after the other, whether it's Obamacare, whether it's these, 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 other, uh, these other acts of the federal government. So it's really the federal government working mostly in unison, as well as that fourth branch of government, the massive bureaucracy, against the states and against the individual. So you're looking at the Constitution to provide the means for restoring self-government, and you even go as far as to suggest otherwise there is the potential of social collapse. Well, I mean, when you have a federal government that has unfunded liabilities over $90 trillion, and three years ago it was $67 trillion, I mean, it's growing that fast. When you have a federal government that is imploding and expanding at the same time, when you have a Federal Reserve that is just mindlessly, uh, you know, printing money through, through uh, quantitative easing and so forth, and when you have politicians who are only rewarded if they spend uh, your children and your grandchildren's uh, uh, money and future, not if they try and draw the line. And so the system is broken because we're unmoored from the Constitution. So the notion of limited government was all swept away with a big exclamation mark with Obamacare and so many laws before it. Yeah. All right, we're going to take a break. We'll come back. We'll continue much more with the great one, Mark Levin, and we'll go through these liberty amendments, and then we'll get to our distinguished studio audience when the special edition of Hannity continues straight ahead. And welcome back to the special audience edition of Hannity as we take you inside the Liberty Amendments written by best-selling author, radio talk show host, the great one, Mark Levin. All right, let's go through the amendments. You have, what, 11 that 11 you propose? Proposed. Okay. The first one, an amendment to establish term limits for members of Congress. Before you tell us, I'm going to turn to our audience. Uh, there we have it up on the screen. And ask all of you, how many think that this would be a good amendment as proposed by Mark? Uh, we have some, to, Steve, you disagree. Okay, you can argue in a minute, but explain this amendment. 
Well, we have term limits for President of the United States. I think we ought to have term limits for members of Congress um, because the history of our republic, the framers never intended there to be professional politicians. That's why they staggered their terms. That's why they limited their terms. That's why the Senate was actually uh, made up of members appointed by the state legislatures. They would be appalled by career politicians. And uh, you can read their letters, you can read their writings. They expected these people to go home and retain their farms and, become, and stay as farmers and, re and stay as businessmen and so forth. They didn't believe in a permanent um, legislative class. And as a matter of fact, um, uh, Professor Rotunda has written that the House of Representatives turns over less than the House of Lords. Yeah, you put that in the book. Even, even, even in out, 2010. Yeah, 2010 you pointed out 85%, which was a wave election. We call it a tidal wave election. 85% still got reelected. Right, and some of them didn't run for reelection. Yeah. So, you know, you have 85% incumbency and we're cheering it. Whereas, uh, you know, in the 1800s, uh, you had 50% turnover after two years and 80 percent turnover after four years. Yeah, from 1850 to 1898, you put this in the book, a turnover rate of 50.2 percent. Right. Let me, if I can, go over to uh, Steve Bannon, Breitbart. Why would you be against this, Steve? I, I like the, the book in that it looked like an organic whole, all 11 amendments kind of hung together. This is the one I really had a problem with. I just don't think, we, particularly today, that you want engagement in our democracy. I just think this takes the vote and it takes the tool. And I realize that with the power of media and all of that, it's really gotten to be like the House of Lords where they don't, they, they never leave. But I don't, I think if you force it and put a cap on it, it takes that one thing away from the people. And it, it, I would support it if it, it was totally tied in as an organic hold all 11. This is the one I had the biggest problem with. You, you brought up in the book how historically this is how it was intended to be. Why don't you right. explain maybe to Steve? Well, historically it was, and it's not that people won't be able to vote. You can still vote for state representatives, state senators, governors, uh, members of the House, House, you can still vote for them and you can still vote in primaries. It's that they are limited to how long they can serve and there's a reason for that. You can see, look, you can't talk about breaking up the ruling class and that mentality without breaking up the ruling class and that mentality. And more than any group up there, uh, Congress has become very insular they pass these laws. I mean, Obamacare was passed around 10 at night, 12, 12. Nobody got to see the final legislation. That's because they pat each other on the back, they get along, they're all great and so forth. And in terms of citizen participation, because of incumbency, like gerrymandering, like um, uh, free media, if you look at John McCain is on TV about every 14 minutes as an example, uh, it becomes more and more difficult for, for citizen challengers to be effective, and that's what the framers wanted, really. You look at gerrymandering in this country, uh, the House of Representatives, uh, depending on the district, it is extremely difficult to dislodge an incumbent. And what I'm saying is there, there ought to be a, uh, and the framers, uh, I think, based on their own writings, would be stunned by what's going on. So I think we, we, we ought to try and portray what they were intending to do. Let's go to the Second Amendment, to, and it's to call to restore the Senate. And the first thing you do, the 17, the amendment is hereby repealed, and all senators shall be chosen by their state legislatures as prescribed by Article 1. How many think this is a good idea? Anybody disagree? Terry Jeffrey. All right, we'll get to you in a second. This was the original intention, and this is the way we used to do it. Explain. And it was defective. But this was part of the progressive movement in 1913, this along with the uh, federal yeah, income tax. And the reason is the progressives were trying to weaken the states, as they always are. So um, they attacked the states where the states had the, the, the only institution where they had a voice in the federal government. It was absolutely crucial, too, or there would be no constitution today, because the states insisted on a say in the making of federal legislation. Uh, so the Federalists have always tried to, to uh, diminish the state's role, always tried to empower the federal government. And so now you can even see, you have senators, I'll give you an example, the Commonwealth of Virginia, I've talked about this. You had the Attorney General of Virginia, Ken Cuccinelli, the first one out of the box, suing on what? Obamacare. Then you have the two senators from Virginia doing what? Voting for Obamacare. Web and, yeah. Well, because their, their allegiance isn't to the state legislature or anything of the sort. The state legislature isn't even as important as some 
powerful lobby group on K Street. Well, people won't know is this is the way it was done for 124 years. All right, Terry, uh, your opposition to this. You know, I agree with every other amendment that Mark proposes in his book except this one. I think it's unnecessary because of the amendment that Steve opposes. It, Mark's term limit amendment says 12 years in Congress, period. Right now you can only serve six years in the Senate, so two terms would be max. Probably a lot of people going to the Senate would serve in the House, so you're going to have people serving only one term in the United States Senate. I saw John Kerry say the other day he spent 29 years in the United States Senate. He was, many of those years, a junior senator to Ted Kennedy. So there was no turnover, as Mark says, in the Congress. But I think you get the term limits in there, and and you let the people vote directly for the senators, and that's going to keep people active in politics. Just, by the way, I think Mark's call for this convention is going to make people a lot more interested in the grassroots on who gets in to their state legislature. All right, quick response, yeah. Well, 12 years, they can do a hell of a lot of damage. We have a president for eight years, and the term limits is very, very important. But who are they representing during those 12 years? They claim to represent the people of the state. Uh, they don't. They may or they may not. But the f the problem isn't just that they're limited to 12 years. The problem is the states don't have any say in the legislation that's coming down the pike, whether they're there two months or 12 years or 25 years. Yeah. All right. We're going to take a break. More with our studio audience. More with the great one, Mark Levin, as we continue on the special audience edition of Hannity, and much more coming up straight ahead. Welcome back to the special audience edition of Hannity, and we also now are going to be bringing in our studio audience. But first, let's go to Amendment Number Three, an amendment to establish term limits for the Supreme Court justices and a supermajority legislative override. Audience, agree? Hands up. How many disagree? All right. Well, th this I support. Go ahead, Andy. I just have one tweak. Why? Why a supermajority, Mark? You know, a a regular, uh, why a supermajority to override the Supreme Court? In a regular Supreme Court case, one unelected lawyer can, can shift the balance. Why do, why because do we need today it's zero. And so, um, and I do respect the notion of the independence of the uh, Supreme Court. And I'm not advancing the notion of majoritarianism. So I do think there ought to be a higher threshold. But I really don't believe there's any historical justification whatsoever. And I would challenge anybody to present it to have one person on the Supreme Court shifting the nation radically in one direction or another on a whole host of issues that don't even belong in front of the Supreme Court, that belong in the states, if even there. Uh, these, are, these, are, these are nine imperfect human beings. Uh, historically, some have been extremely imperfect. Uh, the Supreme Court's had some great decisions and some real doozies. Uh, I'll give you an example. Dred Scott is the prime example, but there are many. Uh, what if we had recourse to Dred Scott short of Civil War? I mean, why, uh, look at, look at uh, uh, Roe v. Wade. Whatever your opinion is, the nation is permanently divided on this without resolution because a handful of lawyers impose their will on the American people. I don't know how you can call this a constitutional republic when something of that nature occurs. Judicial review is an implied power in the Constitution. It's not even there. Somebody has to make a final decision. But a final decision that affects society so thoroughly and the society is still anxious and frustrated by it, there has to be some kind of recourse to it. And why shouldn't it be a broader segment of the population, a broader segment of society, three-fifths of the state, not popular vote, three-fifths of the states? You know, we conservatives, we talk about federalism all the time. So do we support federalism or don't we support federalism? Are the states so rotten and the federal government so wonderful? Is the Supreme Court so beautiful and, and, and nobody else can make decisions? I don't believe that for a minute. Anybody want to respond to that? Somebody. I have silenced them. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. Jeffrey Maybe Lord. Not. Go ahead, Jeff. Talk about, you mentioned in your book, settled law. I mean, I remember Arlen Specter grilling either John Roberts or Sam Alito about, well, can't we consider Roe v. Wade settled law? The fact of the matter is we don't think it's settled law. So how do we decide what is, quote, unquote, settled law in terms of opposing these things? Well, it is more settled if society more broadly makes the decision. It is unsettled if a Supreme Court uh, uses invisible ink and adds language to, this, to the Constitution that simply does not exist. And this is a broader point I'd like to make. The left is into nullification. 
The left yes. nullifies the, the Constitution, it nullifies parts of the Constitution, and then when somebody like me dares to say, well, let's embrace that part of the Constitution that allows us to reestablish it, they say, what, oh, you don't support the Constitution? So uh, th these people are doing their, their fan dance, and what I'm saying is, trying to be as consistent as I can, these are suggestions I'm making to reestablish a constitutional republic. I, I'm not, I don't have unassailable knowledge here. If we ever get to the stage of a state convention, I sure as hell hope we do, uh, then we'll have an opportunity to avoid what I think is, is you know, as a republic, doom. Because uh, I don't think we have a lot of time, and I think this is something I hope that, that people will begin to talk about, whether they agree with a particular amendment or not. You, right. you, you talk about Lincoln and Dred Scott. You talk about Jefferson. Is, uh, he was upset over Marbury Madison. Um, in the book, you also talked about Woodrow Wilson, and you said endorsing judicial tyranny. So you look at basically three phases where they have accumulated a lot more power than you think was originally intended. What's particularly interesting, as a side note about Marbury versus Madison, there seems to be belief, conservative, liberal, everything in between and around, that that was a great decision. Well, at the time, it was considered a power grab by the Supreme Court, by Jefferson and Madison and others. And Jefferson's arch enemy uh, was, was, in fact, uh, Marshall. Marshall was the Secretary of State who signed those certificate for the judges who later sued when Jefferson became president, claiming that they had a right to those appointments. And Madison was his Secretary of State and said, no, you don't. And then there's Marshall, who's Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court, ruling on decisions that he made. And apart from that, saying, hey, look, we have the right to make some of these decisions on the Constitution. Somebody has to, when it wasn't even a constitutional question. All I'm saying is, great, Marbury versus Madison. Today, the court's judicial review is judicial activism. I'm not even talking about judicial independence. I'm talking about judicial supremacy. I read these cases as part of my uh, living that I make. Some of them are so outrageous and outlandish. And to sit here in June every year, to sit on the edge of our seats, to wait for some breathtaking decision coming down from on high, when you read it and you say, good God, what a knucklehead decision here, and it affects the entire nation? I think a great republic can do better than that. We'll take a break. We'll come back more with our studio audience and the great one, Mark Levin. His new book, The Liberty Amendments, more with Mark. By the way, we always want to hear from you. Log on to our special companion site, HannityLive.FoxNews.com. You follow the live show. You share your thoughts on this and much more. Also on Twitter, at Sean Hannity. Quick break. Right back. We'll continue. Welcome back to the special audience edition of Hannity. We continue with the great one, Mark Levin, along with our studio audience. His new book, The Liberty Amendments, Restoring the American Republic. All right, let, let me throw up four of the amendments because we're never going to get through them otherwise. All right, number four, two amendments to limit federal spending and taxing. Number five, an amendment to limit the federal bureaucracy. Number six, an amendment to promote free enterprise. Number seven, an amendment to protect private property. It's a lot that you're throwing up there. But especially as it relates to limiting spending and taxing, you, you talk at length how this is a coming catastrophe. To use the exact words, uh, Congress adopting a budget, th this is our undoing. This nation cannot survive, especially with unfunded liabilities. Well, there's no question about it, and they're not going to do anything about it. I mean, uh, every time there's a continuing resolution, it passes. Every time there's a debt ceiling increase, it passes. It, does, it occurs under Republican president, Democrat presidents. You know, the most profligate administration prior to this one was the one before it, the Republican administration, George W. Bush. And for six years, he had a Republican House and a Republican Senate. That did it for me. That, well, let's elect Republicans. And no, it doesn't work that way. Um, and even when you look at Obamacare right now, it's as if uh, we're talking about Armageddon to try and defund it. We can't even have the fight over it because we might lose seats. Well, let me suggest this to the Republican Party. Why don't you propose tripling the spending on Obamacare, change your name to Democrats, and you might win seats then. <laughs> <laughs> the, bo the bottom line on all these amendments is this. Uh, yeah. Oh. I want you to add one thing. You're talking about taxing no more than 15% of a person's income, and you want the deadline to file taxes to be the day before Election Day, not April 15th, the day before Election Day. You know, I decided to take a look at a calendar. It's like the two furthest dates possible are Tax Day and Election Day. And I said, let's make them the two closest dates possible. 
So rather than these politicians telling us what they're going to do for us, we feel what they've done to us, at least those of us who still pay taxes. So it's fresh in our mind when we're going to that voting booth and we are ticked off about what they've done to us in our country. If we don't have a constitutional amendment to limit the, the spending, borrowing, and printing of the federal government, and if we don't have a sister amendment to limit the type of taxing and the limit on taxation, uh, we're not going to be a free people. Milton Friedman made the point over and over again, and he wasn't the first, and he won't be the last. You know, your, your property rights, whether it's income, whether it's intellectual, whether it's from physical labor, whatever it is, that, that is intertwined with your liberty. And you can see now in the federal government, we, you need more skin in the game, 40%, 50%. I would just make this point. When you wake up every morning and go to work, and you come back every night after you've worked, the government, like the mob, is claiming 40 or 50 percent of what you have, no matter how they waste the money, no matter if they violate the Constitution and talk about redistributing wealth and all the rest. These are illegitimate purposes. You know, you write in the book, uh, Niger, he writes about, we're on the path to financial ruin, 2008. $10 trillion debt, now it's a $17 trillion debt. Reaction? In order, uh, first of all, I want to applaud you, Mark, not only for your books, but for what you do every day making the Constitution come to Thank life. You, Nigel. Um, and it's really important because for us to be successful in this intellectual battle, we have to bring the Constitution to life and we have to educate and inform the low informed and the misinformed voter. I see us all here as missionaries for preaching the gospel of limited government. Well, is that yeah. something that uh, you think is a priority for us? I think it is the priority. And you know, before any of these things can happen, we have to make the case. That was beautifully said. And my point is that we're all Paul and Paul at Revere's. We don't have to be experts on the Constitution. We just have to have a working knowledge of what it is we're trying to do. I think the American people are disgusted and fed up. You look at the rating Congress gets, you look at the rating of the president dropping, even the Supreme Court dropping, and you know what? The worse it's get, it gets, and it's going to get worse, the more the people are going to be disgusted with their government. This gives them an out. It at least gives us an opportunity to discuss what's possible under our Constitution. Monica. Mark, congratulations on the book. Great to see oh, you. Oh, thank you, Monica. You know, in 2008, President Obama spoke repeatedly about the fundamental transformation of the nation. Here we are five years later. We've got five years of evidence as to what he meant by that, meaning move the United States away from a constitutional republic based on individual liberty and economic freedom toward a government dependency and welfare state. My worry is that he has moved us, he and the left have moved us past the tipping point where more people are dependent on government than not, and that he's actually changing the very character of the country. I worry about it. I hope I'm wrong. What do you think? I worry about it. I hope we're all wrong. But on the other hand, I'm not about to curl up in a fetal position and surrender the greatest nation on the face of the earth. You know, my grandfather fought at Iwo Jima in Guam. My great uncle fought at Guadalcanal. And you know what they'd be telling me today? Get off your ass and do something about it. Now, the bottom line is, what do we do about it? Do we keep begging that Congress fix itself? Do we keep begging that the Supreme Court comply with the Constitution, that Obama stay in town long enough to do what he's supposed to do? No. These people have a design, and they're not the first. This is just, you know, the trajectory in this nation is very bad where it's headed. We've had an eight-year respite with Reagan, and in my lifetime, that was it. And the next Republican president came in and lurched right back to the whole New Deal notion. If people want New Deal policies, then let them amend the Constitution for them. If they want to redistribute wealth, then let them try and amend the Constitution. I am suggesting that we propose a non-radical constitutional way to try and address this. And ultimately, Monica, if the, if the people don't want to be free, they're not going to be free. All right, when we come back, we'll give you the rest of the amendments and more of our studio audience edition of Hannity. We continue with the great one, Mark Levin, his book, The Liberty Amendments, Restoring the American Republic, as we continue. Welcome back to this special audience edition of Hannity. We continue with the always outspoken, nationally syndicated radio talk show host. His brand new book, The Liberty Amendments, Restoring the American Republic, and our guest of uh, brilliant studio audience members, all of you. Uh, all right, let's go through the remaining amendments, then we'll take questions. Uh, proposal 8, an amendment to grant the state's authority to directly amend the Constitution. Uh, number 9, an amendment to grant the state's authority to check Congress. Number 10, an amendment to protect the vote. Here's the thing. I think the state should have the ability to amend the Constitution by two-thirds vote. I figure if the Supreme Court could do it by five to four, the states ought to have the ability by two-thirds vote. Um, 
and that's a tough supermajority to get. So if people think that's just, uh, e it's easy to change the, it's not, but it needs to be somewhat less than what it is today. Also, uh, I suggest that the states by three-fifths vote be able to override a uh, federal statute or a federal regulation that has a value of $100 million or more. All right, let's go to our audience. Uh, Jenny Beth Martin, Tea Party Patriots. Hi. Mark, I love your book. And the thing that I really like the most about it is that having seen the way the IRS has targeted Tea Party groups and other conservative groups, you and I have talked about this a lot. I think we have to get to the root of the problem. And the root in that situation really is not another taxpayer bill of rights. We've already had three of those since the 80s. It's not solving the 73,000 pages of tax code. We've got to go to the root. And I applaud what you're doing, and we look forward to helping make it a reality. Thank you. And it's Wonderful. God David, bless. Li David Limbaugh, hi. Congratulations, Mark. I became a. Who are you again? What? Huh? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Take note of this name. Okay. <laughs> David, what? Yeah. <laughs> I became a reluctant convert just reading the first chapter alone. And I was a skeptic. I even wrote a, a column a year ago opposing what I thought this was. It's not what I thought it was. But my question is. We all know that the people who would become the framers of the Constitution met ostensibly to amend the Articles of Confederation, and they ended up rewriting the entire uh, document and, and made a new Constitution. Playing devil's advocate, I mean, I think I know the answer to this question. What would you say to those who were, are skeptics of this process and say, hey, this could be hijacked. If you open this up to the status, it could end up, uh, they could accelerate us even, even faster into statism and full-blown Marxism. That's a great Marxism. question. Yeah, go ahead. It's not really a good question. No, it's an excellent question. Two, but, two points. But go ahead. First of all, the statists already have the system opened up to them. This is what Woodrow Wilson preached <clears throat> in a speech in 1906, where the courts would have more power than the other branches of government, where the President of the United States would exercise his power as fulsomely as he possibly could, where Congress would legislate, where Congress thinks it ought to legislate, and where the states are basically smothered. So the status already have what they want, and they're going to continue to push that agenda. As for this, this uh, uh, if we open up the, the convention process, can't they take over the country and so forth? It takes three-fourths of the states to ratify this. If three-fourths of the states decide today that they want to overturn the Constitution of the United States, they can do it. So it's not like I'm opening Pandora's box. Pandora's box can be opened almost right. at any time. Michelle Malkin, hi. I love the book. I read it in one sitting. Thank you, Michelle. Cover to cover, not just the Washington read, the back cover, the whole thing. <laughs> and my, my children thank you, their future children thank you well. for opening up this incredibly important and necessary dis discussion. Here's my one concern, and yeah. I, you know, whether you agree or disagree with any of the particular amendments, this discussion and even the possibility of a constitutional convention presupposes a civic culture that embraces the, the, the things that we all hold in common, an appreciation of founding principles, industriousness, um, a rejection of the kind of secular extremism that got in, us into this mess in the first place. How are we going to move forward? We all agree that we need to move forward by looking back at how we got here, but you've had generations of Americans who've been brainwashed in the very progressivism that we're trying to fight to save the country. What do you do? That, that's a good point, but here's, here's my take on this. It took one-third of the population to fight the Revolutionary War. It takes the activists organizing to make the changes. You're never going to get a whole set, a, a, a broad swath of the American people, 70, 80 percent, that are going to get involved in this. A large percentage of the American people simply are not going to be involved, as they weren't in the Revolutionary War, as they haven't been in so many decisions that are taking place. What's going on in Washington now, you know, you read the Gallup polls, about 20% of the American people say that they're liberals. Well, the 20% pretty much are running things, and the rest of them, the Republicans, are status quo. So we need to be that 20%, 30%, or 40% to start um, pressing our case. Look, here's the other thing. When you start talking about these things, you don't know where they're going to lead, or you start uh, acting in ways that promote this, this kind of agenda. We don't know where they're going to lead, but if we don't do anything, I do know where that's going to lead.
All right, we've got to take a break. We're going to get the rest of our studio audience in. We'll continue more with Mark Levin. If you haven't seen it, the Liberty Amendments, Restoring America, the America Republic. And more questions, comments coming up next. Straight ahead. And welcome back to the special audience edition of Hannity. We continue now with the great one, Mark Levin. His brand new book, The Liberty Amendments, Restoring the American Republic. Back to our distinguished group of scholars, uh, Deneen Borelli. Congratulations, Mark. Uh, we, someone mentioned status. Uh, Monica mentioned the left. I am so tired of the elites claiming they, they want to help those who need the help the most. Look at what the EPA is doing, for example, and how they are locking up our energy. We have the most abundant energy resources in our country. Is there anything in your book that addresses that issue and what we, what we can do about it with the regulations? Yes, the, one of the proposed amendments would enable uh, three-fifths of the states to overturn any federal regulation that has a $100 million value or more. David Webb. Mark, we talk about what the left does, and Monica did earlier. We know what they're going to do, so now my problem is what do the Republicans do? If we're going to fix this issue starting at the state level, we've got to get rid of the elitist Republicans. And I'll give you an example of how the system itself wins. Mitch McConnell's a 30-year senator. Rand Paul talks the talk, but endorses Mitch McConnell for six more years. The system is strong. What do we do about the Republicans? Well, first of all, we don't focus at that level. We focus at the delegate. That's the example. What I'm saying I, is I at the it. state, we have that but idea, too. We focus too. at the delegate and state senate level, where you have a better opportunity for citizens to challenge these these this, this sort of inbred political system. You're exactly right. Our biggest problem, at least initially, is going to be what I call the French Republicans, because mm -hmm. that's what they are. They give up. They 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 their status quo. They, and and so we have to defeat them. And the my surrender is, caucus. The surre we have to go over their heads. We have to go around them. A new farm team. We build some new people. Whatever we can do, and it's going to have to be done from the bottom up. Joel Pollack, Breitbart. Mark, you and I spoke about this during our discussion on Breitbart. But I think a lot of people, when they hear about new constitutional amendments, will think about the social conservative amendments that we hear about every four years during the Republican primaries, things about same-sex marriage or abortion. And you don't go into those kinds of social issues in your book. And I think it's very interesting to hear your explanation as to why. Well, because these amendments are aimed at the systemic problems, not any specific issue, pro-con this, pro-con that, pro-con this. Who should be making these decisions? Where these decisions should be made? How we break up this, this centralized concentration of power? And those decisions should be made where those decisions should be made. First and foremost, where possible at home. Secondly, at the state level. But the federal government, really, the court, the Supreme Court, and so forth. What I'm addressing is, if we have these big societal issues, how should they be addressed? And I'm talking about federalism and unraveling the central government, whatever the issue is unless it's in the Constitution. Jedediah. Hey, Mark. Um, how much of this problem do you think has to do with GOP messaging? I worked with kids for a long time. I can tell you that young people are drawn to libertarianism. They care about their civil liberties. They care about their private property. They don't want to be told that they have to purchase health insurance. So is this, you know, a lot of it having to do with the Republican Party just not packaging what you're doing here as well as you are? I don't think the Republican Party uh, establishment agrees with a damn thing I've said here tonight, to be perfectly honest with you. I think they're perfectly happy with most of this. They just want to run things, and uh, uh, they're timid. And uh, I, I, really, I think the focus has to be from the grassroots up, not the top down, because that's where the statists are, are, are the most effective in breaking up the system. And I do think an, an argument about liberty and uh, property rights and these sort of things uh, will be attractive to young people and all people if we explain it properly. But the Republican establishment, I mean, mealy mouth. Todd Starnes. Uh, Mark, I just want to say God bless you uh, for what you're doing for our country. Um, I wanted to touch on something Michelle Malkin mentioned, and this is the idea of assimilation. We've got folks down on the border, they're getting a big old package of food stamps, and they're getting a Democratic registration card when they come across the border. How do we fix that? How do we tell the newcomers into this country about the greatness of our nation? Well, we can't rely on the federal government to do that, can we? Because the federal government's propaganda is basically welcome, and this is how you get food stamps, and this is the program, and we're going to hire navigators and show you how to do all this stuff. I don't know how to answer that question. 
All right, last but certainly not least, <laughs> Katie Pavlich. I'll do my best. Thank you so much, Mark, for coming and spending your whole night with us. Um, I can't. I don't think we can leave here without addressing the next generation. And I think that we live now in a, an entitlement society. And you have the president of the United States calling 26-year-old kids. How do you get young people who are going to pay for what's going on now, they're going to pay for that $90 trillion in liabilities, to be interested in things like the Constitution and understand how it can make their lives better? You know, I think it wouldn't hurt if we tell them the truth because the problem is Obama and the media and academia are feeding them a pile of you-know-what, and I think we tell them the truth. You can't find a job because the centralized government, top-down authoritarian type economy doesn't work. We tell them a truth about free speech. You know, all those speech codes on your college campus, that comes from the left. If it was up to us, you'd be able to free, speak freely. And we go into these issues because you're right, and you're right, and you're right. Our agenda as, as conservatives should be the agenda that young people and that the next generation support. But I'm going to tell you something. At some point, they are going to come to us because this thing's going to collapse. This cannot keep up, whether it's, whether it's the economy or any of the rest of it. And we have to be prepared when that catastrophe occurs to lead. And hopefully part of the argument will be the argument in this book. All right, ladies and the great one, Mark Levin. All right. And thanks all of you for coming as well. And that is all the time we have left this evening. As always, let not your heart be troubled. The news continues. We'll see you back here soon on Hannity. Stay tuned. Fox News continues.